Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Women, press, freedom is the name of our talk. Dear guests, um, welcome to the Ralf Badawi talk in 2021. The Börsenverein des Deutschen Buchhandels, the German Publishers and Booksellers Association, and the Friedrich Naumann Stiftung for Freedom are proud to present to you this year's Ralf Badawi talk. And we are especially honored to be able to welcome again and Safaida, Raif Badawi's wife. <laughs> My name is Margit Ketterle, already mentioned. I'm a German nonfiction publisher within Drömer Knauer. And more important in our context here, I am a member and the spokesperson of the Freedom of Expression Group within the Börsenverein. And I'm a board member of the newly established World Expression Forum in Lillehammer, Norway, aspiring to be one day the Davos of the free word, word, not world, word, free <laughs> word. In both groups, we try to raise awareness for violations of human rights and freedom of speech, art, and opinion. In the German general public and in the case of Vexpo, with audiences worldwide. We lobby for endangered and persecuted colleagues in the wider publishing sphere, that is authors, publicists, journalists, publishers, and booksellers worldwide, which you of course know have been imprisoned, have been decapitated and not treated very nicely from Hong Kong to India, to all autocratic countries we unfortunately face in this world. In Germany, we hold an annual week for freedom of expression every May, with topics ranging from Ukraine to censorship, book bans, hate speech, and the fight against racism and anti-Semitism. World Expression Forum in Lillehammer is hosting an international two-day conference every year with wide-ranging topics and international speakers and public. But let me come to the topic of our talk tonight, our Raif Badawi talk, it's called Shrinking Spaces. And this is the key term of our evening here, and especially shrinking spaces for women journalists from Afghanistan, Iran, and Turkey. And unfortunately, our colleague from Iran can join us tonight because she unexpectedly fell ill and had to cancel on a very short notice. So in each of these three countries, nevertheless, the freedom of expression is in decline in varying degrees, I would say. And the situation for women, especially, to speak up and raise their voice against inequality, persecution, and the denial of human rights is intolerable. Shrinking spaces, this term unfortunately applies not only to the countries ours, of our speakers tonight, but to freedom of expression in general. And it is not only authorities, authorities, excuse me, authorities and regimes that are shrinking it, but often we shrink it ourselves. When we confine ourselves to the question of whose side are you on? And we do not remain forever on the side of freedom, humanity, and rationality. So it is my very great pleasure to welcome here tonight Nefshin Mengü from Turkey, who arrived only today and has to fly back home tomorrow. <laughs> She's a journalist and prominent news presenter, author, former correspondent to Iran. So you maybe can add a few uh, <laughs> things on Iran as well, and about which she also has written a book. Vajma Toki is coming from Afghanistan with a degree in political science and law, I understand, and she worked internationally in Afghanistan for nine years and was member of the youth parliament there. And since August 2021, when the regime, when the Taliban took over and the regime collapsed, she was able to get out to Germany. And since then has been a very active supporting underground schools in Afghanistan. 
And last but not least, our moderator, Rebecca Schönenbach. And uh, we are very much looking forward to your enlightening t discussions tonight. Um, and thank you all for making the effort to talking to us today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Margit Ketterle. I would now ask Anne Brasseur from the board of the Friedrich Naumann Stiftung für die Freiheit, Friedrich Naumann Stiftung for Freedom, which is also a very fitting name for a panel like this, and who is the organizer of this Raif Badavi talk, to join us and take the floor. Thank you very much. Guten Abend. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, dear panelists. We are living in an awful world for the moment with shrinking spaces. We are living in a period where we have war, where we have oppression, where we have destruction, where we have uh, terrorist attacks. And it's really very frightening. So the answer could be, well, let's shrink even more the freedom of expression. But that's not the answer we have to give. I'm a member of the board of the, as you rightly said, thank you very much, of the board of uh, trustees from the Friedrich Naumann Foundation für die Freiheit, for freedom. So freedom is the highest good we can have. And with freedom, of course, comes along a long responsibility. So each of us, if we want to have freedom, we also need to be responsible for our freedom because freedom is not just granted. But unfortunately, as you really said, there is a tendency of shrinking freedoms even in our countries. And that's why journalism is more and more important. We need journalists who can read, who can write whatever they want and be based on uh, the Convention on Human Rights of the Council of Europe. I had the opportunity in my political career, I come from Luxembourg, but in my political career to be the president of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. And the Europe Convention on Human Rights says in Article 10, and I want to repeat it here, everyone has the right to freedom of expression. This right shall include freedom to hold opinions and to receive and impart information and ideas without interference by public authority and regardless of frontiers. But when we look what is happening in countries like Turkey, for instance, where more and more uh, media belongs, in fact, to friends of the leader uh, of, uh, well, I'm, I'm not going to tell his name, but the leader of, uh, of uh, Turkey. So that means that it is really uh, shrinking spaces. Uh, in Turkey, for instance, also, uh, Malak uh, Kavala has been uh, awarded uh, the uh, the prize, the Václav Havel Prize of Human Rights Prize of the Council of Europe two weeks ago. He is a human rights defender and he's in prison. And despite the fact that the Court for Human Rights of the Council of Europe said that he has to be released, and they said it twice, he has not been released. And that is terrible that countries, even members of the Council of Europe, who signed the Convention on Human Rights, don't fulfill the conditions, in fact, to be members. So what we have to do is to continue to talk to them, because excluding those countries, and Russia is, 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 has excluded itself now uh, after the first of uh, the terrible war Putin started in uh, invading Ukraine, but all the other countries, they subscribe to the Convention on Human Rights and also to Article 10. But unfortunately, there is another perception. During my career, 
I heard speeches like, well, you have Western values and we have traditional values. And, but we have the same values and we must stand for them. And that's why I'm so grateful that we have courageous men and women and especially women uh, now to defend freedom of speech because what they are facing is really horrible. They are really like you, journalists and human rights defenders. They are facing terrible sanctions by uh, regimes. But what we need now in these difficult times we are going through is an independent press where we get information in order and true information in order for decision makers to take the right decisions. Because without the truth, you can't make good decisions. So today, freedom of speech, freedom of expression is more important than ever. And I would like to thank you for all your courage, and we are supporting you. And I'm proud today to represent here the uh, Friedrich Naumann Foundation for freedom. And let's fight together for freedom. We owe that to our predecessors, and we owe that also to the next generation. Thank you very much. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much, Anne Brasseur. Um, as we stand for freedom today, we do not exclude men from this panel. So we have at least one man speaking tonight. And as the co-founder of the Raif Badavi Talk, who jointly organized it with the Friedrich Naumann Stiftung for Freedom. And he's a well-known anchor man in Germany. His name is Konstantin Schreiber and he sent us a video statement, which will be displayed now. 10 years ago, Saudi blogger Raif Badawi was sentenced to 1,000 lashes and 10 years in prison because of blog posts that were seen as anti-Islamic. The publicly carried out punishment sparked outrage the world over, as did his 10 year term in prison, which ended just one and a half years ago, and since when he hasn't been allowed to leave Saudi Arabia. Raif Badawi's fate reminds us all of the importance of freedom of speech and of the dangers facing this freedom in times like these. And when countries, regimes, dictators aim at silencing critical voices, this holds even more true for women trying to raise their voices and speak out against injustice and wrong. And this is why it is of great importance to put them in the center of this year's Raif Badawi talk at Frankfurt Book Fair. I truly hope this sends out a strong message that women and the pivotal role they play in societies in the West, in the Middle and Near East, anywhere, cannot be silenced any longer, and that their contribution to shaping the world of tomorrow gets the attention they deserve. Thank you all for attending this year's event. And now we have our esteemed guest, Enza Faida. She's not only the wife of Raif Badawi, which in itself is already a false courage to be married to Raif Badawi, who is prosecuted in Saudi Arabia. But since her husband has been in prison, she has become a fearless and fierce voice for freedom. Please welcome Enza Faida. مساء الخير بعد عشر سنوات من الألم والكفاح والصبر رائف أصبح حر أخيرا ولكن لم يسعنا أن نفرح بخروجه فقد صدمنا بمنعه من السفر بعد خروجه لمدة عشر سنوات أخرى لكم أن تتخيلوا عشر سنوات أخرى Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. After 10 years of pain, struggle, and patience, Raif was finally free, but we could not celebrate his freedom or his release. We were shocked that he was banned from traveling for other 10 years. 
Can you imagine what this means, 10 more years? مما يعني أن أبناء رائف لن يستطيعوا رؤيته إلا بعد مرور عشرين سنة. هل هناك في العالم أقسى وأبشع من ذلك؟ This means that Raif's children will not be able to see him until 20 years have passed in total. Is there anything that is more cruel and more horrific than this fate? سيداتي سادتي زوجي رائف بدوي رجل مسالم لم يرفع السلاح يوما بل لا يعرف كيف يستخدمه كان سلاحه القلم الذي أشهره في وجه الظلم واستبداد رجال الدين في بلده وبعد أن دفع ثمانا غاليا ها هي السعودية تطبق ما دعا إليه رائف وقاده للسجن طويل لسجن طويل وظالم نعم السعودية تتغير ولكنها للأسف لا زالت تظلم رائف بمنعه من الالتحاق بأسرتي في كندا Ladies and gentlemen, my husband, Raif Badawi, is a man of peace. He has never raised a weapon, and he doesn't even know how to do so. His only weapon was his pen, which he wielded in the face of injustice and of tyranny in the country. And after he has paid a huge price, Saudi Arabia is implementing what he was calling for and what led him to be behind bars for many years. Yes. Saudi Arabia is changing, but unfortunately, it's still not changing the oppression of Raif by preventing him from traveling and from joining his family in Canada. لقد كانت منظمة فريدريش نومان دائما إلى جانب قضيتنا بداية من إنشاءهم لجائزة الصحفيين الشجعان وإلى لقاءنا هذا شكرا فريدريش نومان وشكرا لوجودكم. The Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom has always been on our side and has always supported our cause, beginning with the establishment of the Raif Badawi Award for Courageous Journalists and up to these talks that we will be listening to this evening. So thank you to the foundation and thank you all for coming. And Zaf, would you like to take one or two questions? So are there questions to answer Faida? Now is your chance. <laughs> we can hardly see you, so please raise your arm because otherwise I'm not able. Um, can I ask a question? Oh, sure. Uh, is it my, my, my journalistic side just pops up. Um, I was wondering how, what she thinks of um, Mr. Bin Salman's reform agenda, so to say. So I'm very difficult to ask because I'm now in the Saudi Arabia, it's been about 10 years. So what I see is that there's a change. أنا بالنسبة لي كشخص أنا ما نشايف التغيير ممكن إنه يكون في تغيير المرأة حصلت على جزء من حقوقها اللي كانت محرومة منها بس كحرية تعبير كحرية صحافة ما في مش شايفة. That is a tough one to answer. But I have been out of Saudi Arabia for over 10 years, so I cannot truly answer it from an insider perspective. But yes, there is change to be seen. But at the same time, when I see it is change that is perceived from the outside, but I do not feel it. Yes, we see that women are having their rights partially reinstated, some of the rights that they have been deprived of. But at the same time, when you look at the freedom of expression, freedom of press, I do not see it. Yes, we have a question here. Yeah, thank you. Is there any political initiative at the moment ongoing to negotiate with uh, Saudi Arabia the freedom of your men? على حسب تواصلي أنا مع المنظمات أو مع الحكومات إنه في محاولات ولكن 
إلى الآن ما في ما في أي تغيير ما في أي ما في أي أخبار عن تغيير الحكم اللي هو منع السفر يعني رايف قضى عشر سنوات في السجن وبما إنه الآن تغيرت السعودية فالمفروض إنه يكون في يعني مش مواجهة إنه يكون في يعني محاولة قوية في إنه رايف يلتحق بأولاده في كندا ولكن للأسف يعني بمجرد ما إنه طلع رايف كأنه يعني خلاص صار حر أنا بالنسبة لي رايف لا زال في السجن يعني هو كان في سجن سجن صغير والآن صار في سجن كبير يعني ما في أي تغيير بالنسبة لنا. As far as my knowledge extends and as far as I'm informed, there are governments and organizations that um, are trying or that speak about this, but we still have no good news, so to say, because the travel ban that has been issued. after 10 years of imprisonment is still standing. And yes, we see there is a change in the in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And I think since this change is there, maybe we should invest in stronger efforts in order to allow Raif to travel and to rejoin his children in Canada. They released him and to them, he is free now, but this is not true. He is still imprisoned. He just moved from a small prison to a larger one. The lady in front. I just wanted to ask you what your husband is doing now. الوضع لا زال بالنسبة الرائف صعب يعني إنسان سجن لمدة عشر سنوات يعني وضعه متوقف طلع على حياة لازم يبدأ من أول وجديد ف. الوضع لا زال صعب بالنسبة له كحياة ك... كأنه يندمج ويتأقلم مع الوضع الآن فإنه يشتغل فإنه ورايف مجاله يعني مجال رايف كله صحافة فرايف ممنوع كمان من السوشيال ميديا ممنوع من أي تواصل آ... آ... ميديا أو تلفزيون آ... لمدة عشر سنوات كمان يعني بالنسبة له أعماله لا زالت متوقفة وحتكون متوقفة لمدة عشر سنوات كمان. The situation at the moment for him or what he's doing it's um, quite hard to describe because after 10 years in prison of course the his entire life has come to a stop. It is hard to restart a life after 10 years. It is the situation is tough on him and it is hard to go out to be free to reintegrate to have a daily life even. to go to work because his work was always revolved about expression and press and media work. And he is still banned from publishing, from publishing what he writes, from social media, from TV for 10 more years. So everything is still on ice for him. So I take the freedom to ask the last question to answer Fida. What can we do to help you and your husband to further what he has done to, to enlarge your voice We, we know we can pressure our governments, but what else could we do? بصراحة السؤال كتير صعب يعني ما حقدر إني أجاوب عليه بس كل اللي أنا أطلبه إنه نستمر في المواصلة فإنه الآن وقت إنه نرفع صوتنا أعلى فإنه السعودية الآن تتغير أوكي فعشان إحنا نحس بالتغيير اللي قاعد يصير في السعودية رايف ليه لا زال محتجز هناك يعني هذا السؤال أنا نفسي أسأله آه لما يواجهني سؤال إنه هل فعلا السعودية تتغير بالنسبة لي أنا لسه أنا مش شايفة أي تغيير التغيير الحقيقي لما الإنسان يقدر يعبر عن رأيه Uh, فأتمنى إنه السؤال هذا ينسأل إنه ليه رايف لا زال uh, يعتبر بالنسبة لنا إحنا سجين في الدولة فأتمنى إنه المساعدة تكون في إنه رايف يلتحق فينا في كندا قريبا يعني عشر سنوات جدا صعب انتظار عشر سنوات والآن كمان عشر سنوات صعب جدا 
Frankly, this is also a tough one to answer, but um, I think what we can do is continue the efforts and raise our voices even more and more. And since the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is trying to implement change, we need to see tangible changes, tangible for us as well. And I think the question or the thing that we need to ask here and not to ask in maybe in this room, but ask Saudi Arabia as well, since there is change, why has Raif's situation not changed? Why is he still detained in the country? So where is this true change? Because I still don't see it. Why is he imprisoned in the country? Why should we wait 10 more years after waiting the first 10 years when he was in prison for him to rejoin us, to be reunited as a family? So I think this is the question that needs to be answered to the responsible authorities. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your courage. Shukran lakum. Shukran Thank jazeera. You. And now I have the pleasure to talk about a very unpleasant subject with two of our guests, which Ms. Ketter already announced. Nefshin Mengu, reporting mainly on Turkey, but also on Iran and the whole region. And Vashma Turki from Afghanistan, who moved here two years ago. And the topic of our discussion is women, press, freedom, and shrinking spaces. And I think there's no more space that has been shrinking faster than Afghanistan during this last two years. Could you tell us something about the situation now, especially for journalists in Afghanistan? Hello. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me there to raising our voice about the situation of Afghanistan, especially uh, situation of uh, Afghan uh, journalists, Afghan women uh, journalists. Uh, the situation of uh, media in Afghanistan, especially women journalists in Afghanistan, is really worrying. Uh, in the past 20 years, Afghanistan has uh, made uh, progress in its media with uh, more journalists, including brave Afghan women and uh, uh, hardworking to reporting news uh, and uh, sharing stories. Uh, but after 2021, uh, things took a dark turn. Uh, when the Taliban come to power, the freedom of the press uh, that was celebrated is now facing with much big problems. Uh, um, uh, Afghanistan uh, women, especially, uh, they are in, in a tough spot, especially Afghan female journalists in a tough spot. They are worried about their safety. Um, uh, they are worried about the ability to tell the truth. Uh, and uh, these brown women in the past 20 years uh, um, with incredible strength and uh, courage uh, have shown uh, in an environment when being a women uh, journalist is uh, not easy in that environment. Uh, but Afghanistan women, uh, um, especially Afghan journalists, has shown incredible strength uh, and courage in this area, uh, but now 80% of uh, um, uh, women journalists especially are uh, had um, to stop uh, working uh, in, in this area. They are at home now, 80% of female journalists, uh, they choose to um, stay at home beside to feel imprisoned at their work desk. And uh, yeah, day by day, the situation of uh, uh, generally the situation of women of Afghanistan is uh, um, uh, becoming more uh, horrible. Um, this ban not only frees the uh, society, but also took away their dreams, their goals, and their future from them. I want to ask you about the time before the Taliban grasped power again in 2021, because we know there were female judges, there were female journalists, 
um, doctors, school teachers, and so on. But I also read a lot about attacks on women's rights activists and on female journalists already before 2021. So there have been drive-by shootings. There has been a bombing of an Afghan radio station. How was it before? Was it easier but dangerous? Can you tell us a bit about the change that happened? In the past 20 years, Afghanistan, uh, yeah, there was a lot of problems in front of Afghan women, especially uh, in front of uh, Afghan journalists uh, uh, by the Taliban. They uh, targeted them, they killed them in the past 20 years. They killed us, now they are in power. Uh, there was a lot of uh, female journalists that they targeted by the Taliban and killed by the Taliban in the past 20 years. There was like some places in remote area that uh, these places uh, was uh, with Taliban. There was no schools. There was no women to work. Uh, there was uh, like a lot of uh, other uh, restrictions uh, on women. Uh, and uh, they cannot like they could not travel without a mahram on that time also. Uh, in the past 20 years, they burned the schools. They 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 killed the uh, women uh, right activists, uh, Afghan journalists. Uh, that is their ideology. After uh, 2021, uh, they are doing the same things day by day, day by day, by uh, uh, increasing uh, instructions on women in Afghanistan. Uh, they are showing us uh, their ideology that they have. So what you're mentioning, uh, Maha is a male guardian of a yeah, woman. Yeah. So now women are only allowed to leave the house with a male chaperone. Yeah. Uh, uh, they, they should have with their self a male um, mahram and also uh, they are banned to travel um, uh, to do their reporting uh, works and uh, they cannot like talking with the uh, uh, main uh, officials uh, members uh, government official members uh, they are banned uh, to participate in uh, press conferences uh, the, uh, the, the, they are, they cannot, uh, talk with the main, uh, official member in a talk show. B because of this, a lot of like, uh, restrictions on their work, they leave their job and their career. Now, the, the guardianship system is installed in several countries. For example, Saudi Arabia, women are not allowed to decide matters of their own life without a male guardian signing them. It's installed in Iran. The Taliban's first act was to install it in Afghanistan again on women. But we see a different development in Turkey. We're not there yet, maybe, or will, we, will that be a factor? But also women in Turkey face difficulties. Could you tell us a bit about the current situation, especially with the elections that were held this year? Yeah, sure. I mean, obviously, I mean, putting Turkey in the same category with Iran and Afghanistan would be unjust to my colleagues. I mean, mm. to be honest, um, Turkey is in a, in a in a in a different category. Obviously, I mean, the, the one main difference is um, Turkey is a republic with uh, you know some institutions still standing, and Turkey is an organized um, opposition somewhat. So it's it's a it's a different system, obviously. Um, I mean, but this, this, the situation of press freedom, it's, it's awkward. I mean, with Erdogan now, it's been 20 years. So I have one generation, you know, such a long time and it's volatile. We have good days, we have bad days, we have worse days, better days <laughs> like that. But he's in his last term, I think he feels like, you know, I win the elections anyways. He won the last election with 100% inflation, literally. Like we have unbelievable, like you go to the market every week, like you see a price increase. The situation is dire. He won the election under these circumstances. So he's like, you know what? No matter what you report, I win anyways. So I don't think he cares anymore. But I mean, he came to this point because he literally destroyed the press tradition in Turkey. We always had a very vibrant TV um, tradition, newspaper generation, mocking politicians. I'm not saying, I mean, Turkey was the best democracy before Erdogan, but we had something, you know. 
So we had all this TV journalism tradition, which was very vibrant, fast and effective and whatnot. But in time, as you mentioned, basically, uh, so he made by force, semi-force, by playing political games, he made his friends by the main, you know, conventional TV channels. And most of the conventional media is owned by pro Erdogan people. And it's like a um, quasi-mafia system. So what, what he does is like, for example, I'm a really famous business person. He gives me a state bid, like I build a bridge, say. Uh, I do that, I earn a lot of profit, but then he tells me to buy this TV station, like a pro bono work. So I do that for him and I make propaganda for him type of thing. But it's not like uh, everything is banned. It's like, a, it's interesting. So Erdogan is a clever uh, authoritarian uh, or a leader with authoritarian leanings. There are um, TV channels that are really close to the opposition and they oppose Erdogan 24 seven, no matter what he does. But what this does is like the sense of facts, the sense of reality within the Turkish society is absent right now. Like if you are like a pro Erdogan person, you'd watch certain TV channels. If you are a pro opposition uh, you know, uh, person, you'd watch your TV channel and everybody lives in their own reality. Literally, you know, for example, people watching pro Erdogan channels do not hear about the price increases or what they hear is like, oh, this is also in Europe because of the war, because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, for example. So not only in Turkey, they literally, they report, they were reporting like a couple of months ago, saying, there are no eggs in uh, the stores in the United Kingdom. Like they cannot find vegetables in Germany, literally. They're also obsessed about Germany. They're like, there's nothing in Germany. People are like on the streets. Look at these retired people in Germany. They cannot find housing type of thing. So they're fed this and people, these are simple people. Not everybody is like into news 24 seven. They come home after work, they're watching the news. They're saying, wow, right, okay. I mean, really the situation in Germany is very bad. So thank God we are not that bad. You know, people literally believe in this. And on the other hand, if you're watching proposition, I mean, it is also another, literally, I'd say syndrome. They're like 24 seven, they're like, oh my God, we're in the worst situation, what's happening? What Erdogan is really bad. So, but what happens is that we have a traumatized society, like literally, because I do, um, I have my show on YouTube every day. So I like I bring in politicians, I interview them, I interpret what's happening in Turkey. The comments I'm getting is like, literally, we're traumatized. Not I mean, people lost their sense of analytical thinking. For example, like when we report something, people I I am sensing people are not able to understand what they're hearing. Basically, everybody has a very strong opinion. Um, but also, like, there are colleagues like me. So we were in the conventional media. Like, we were, like, renowned anchors, this and that. And we were fired because Erdogan was unhappy, whatnot. But, like, we can do our job on YouTube. But the thing about YouTube, I think the government knows that. So they're not really, they're not touching us, to be honest. I report whatnot, anything. But what they do is, like, for example, they don't, I mean, I don't want to jinx it though, because, you know, judiciary in uh, Turkey is very instrumentalized, but they don't like jail you. But what they do is like, they have their own troll factories and they get you lynched. Like mm -hmm. I was lynched last week because I also, I mean, about this Gaza palace, Israel thing. I also said like, okay, this is IDF's Israel's version of the story. So they started calling me a Zionist, whatnot. And, you know, they're like, she's an Israeli agent and everything. They're like circulating this information. But since they called me a German agent before, I mean, I don't really care. You just lynched on social media and their own TV channels. But I can get, get on with my life. So that that's what they do. But then we do our thing on YouTube, uh, me and colleagues like me. But the thing is, I'm summing it up. The, the problem with the digital media is like, if you're on YouTube, this is the algorithm. So one person watches me and then, you know, it, the, the, he or she's recommended my likes. You see, I mean, you don't see the, I mean, the algorithm does not show you the oppos opposing, uh, in a sense, perspective. So it's, it's the same thing. People are lured into another echo chamber. So that's why we have a really very fragmented uh, and polarized society, I'd say. So I think to that, because you mentioned the dissonance between reality and what people's opinions are and in which kind of reality they feel themselves living in. How does that relate to women's rights? Because we know there are lots of journalists imprisoned in Turkey. So I think 
you say they don't touch you, but that might not go for everybody. Um, is it something relating to women's rights? Because there, there has been a huge campaign. I followed your YouTube channel. It was very good to follow somebody making sense of Turkish elections because it was nearly impossible to make sense of Turkish elections from an outsider's perspective. But when we talk about women's rights in Turkey, that we're really shrinking. The, the, the Erdogan went out of the Istanbul Convention, um, wants to decriminalize violence against women and marriage wants to legalize ch child marriage and so on. And is it being reported and is it dangerous to report on it? And how is it re being received when you speak about topics like that? You can report on it, of course. And when Turkey left Istanbul Convention, there was a huge backlash. So thankfully, we still have a robust feminist movement in Turkey still standing. It's, you know, uh, women NGOs are really strong. That's one thing they haven't been able to destroy. But what they're now doing is, so obviously they they approach this woman's issue like through, there are, how, how shall I put it? Now we uh, switch to this presidential system. And in this presidential system, you have to get 50 point, I mean, 50.1%. You have to get most of the votes. So what Erdogan has is like his staunch supporters is around 30%. So he has to get 50%. How does he reach this 30%? He is trying to catch these fragmented little, you know, fundamentalist groups. Also, he has to cooperate with them. Erdogan himself, I mean, he has his daughters and one of his daughters, she has a woman NGO or whatnot, mm -hmm. fighting for women's rights from their own perspective. So, I mean, he's not... Again, I mean, the thing is, of course, they're looking through a tradi more traditional lens to what a woman means or what a woman's woman, the concept of woman rights means. Uh, but what they, what he does is like now he's in debt to these uh, fundamentalist groups and they're pushing him mm -hmm. to like leave the Istanbul Convention or change some laws, whatnot. But his problem is within AK Party, um, women are also very vocal and strong. So he's kind of in between. They are they are also pushing Erdogan not mm. to do these things. But I think one one now they changed the agenda to LGBTI people. And why they left the Istanbul Convention, their discourse was, oh, this is not about women, but they are trying to impose this LGBTI agenda through this Istanbul Convention. This is why we're leaving it. So mm. they are trying to, you know, uh, how should I say? legitimize it through that. So lens. they linked women's rights and feminism to LGBTQ exactly. issues. They uh, blend it all together. Uh, I want to get back to you, Washma, because you already mentioned that there have been before the takeover in 2021, different regions with different rules and um, different rules also set by the Taliban at the time. How is it now? Is there because there's a general ban on women working. There's a general ban on women for higher education. So girls can only go to school for a couple of years and I think to sixth grade. And after that, they're not allowed. It's the only country in the world where women are not, girls are not allowed to go to school. Whereas the Taliban leaders, some of them bring their girls back to Qatar to get them into school. Afghan women are not allowed to do that. But are there regional differences on women's rights? How can women move freely? And also, does that affect reporting of female journalists? Uh, those women uh, journalists that they work with a uh, national broadcast, uh, broadcasting uh, uh, agency like um, radio and television uh, of Afghanistan, uh, they uh, got tried of uh, all uh, uh, female journalism from the media. And those female journalists that they work uh, with uh, private channels, uh, they forced, uh, uh, were forced to uh, wear uh, face masks. Uh, and uh, also there is uh, some other rules that I before uh, mentioned it, uh, that uh, women cannot uh, participate in a talk show with men. Women cannot like interview um, uh, men, or, uh, government officials, members, uh, women uh, are banned from travel to do their reporting news. And uh, beside of that, uh, there's like a lot of other restrictions on women in Afghanistan, not only in one places, uh, in all Afghanistan. After the collapse, uh, now all countries with them, 
they are in power. Uh, women are banned uh, to pursuing uh, education. They are banned uh, to going to work, to going to park, uh, and also to travel uh, without a mahram. Uh, there was like a lot of um, uh, girls uh, that they, uh, they, they have a scholarship to, to go to, to uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, and, uh, but they, they, from airport, Taliban uh, decided to, they should go to home because they don't have any mahram with them. Mm. And uh, like uh, for now, women in Afghanistan are living in an open prison. Mm. Uh, they are banned from everything. They cannot do anything. Uh, they are not allowed to like work with uh, government uh, departments. Uh, there's like some uh, organization, NGOs like AU, um, there's like, yeah, some women that they work at, from home uh, with them. Uh, a lot of uh, women that they work uh, with the UN, they cannot now work mm -hmm. with them. Uh, totally, totally uh, women are banned from everything. Um, it is like uh, a catastrophe in a country where half of the population uh, are banned from everything. Uh, of course, this ban uh, on women of Afghanistan through the society in every place of the uh, society. Yeah, there is a lot of like um, human rights issue. There is a lot of economic issues in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. They need like AIDS, all the things. Uh, because uh, fifty percent of population of uh, Afghanistan are banned from everything. Uh, before of uh, Taliban collapse, uh, thirty percent of women they work with uh, Afghanistan government. Uh, we had like parliament member mm -hmm. ministries, and we had uh, everything. There was like uh, a lot of other women that they uh, work with uh, private sectors, organizations, NGOs. Day by day, uh, the situation, uh, okay, there was like some security issue from the Taliban. Mm. They attacked on us a lot of time. They tried to stop us, but we had a structures uh, that we uh, can work uh, uh, in that umbrella. Mm. And uh, day by day, the situation of Afghanistan uh, was uh, uh, becoming uh, good for women of Afghanistan. Uh, but uh, suddenly, in one day, I was in office. I, I, I was busy uh, to do my uh, ac uh, like uh, activities uh, to to plan some activities for next month. But my director came to me and told me that Wajma leave the office. Uh, I told uh, her that what's happening, and uh, I was scared inside because uh, other provinces of Afghanistan was already in, in the hand of the Taliban, but uh, only was Kabul that it was, uh, it was with government. And uh, I, I, I had, like, I have uh, uh, like a pain in my inside mm -hmm. on that time. But when my director told me that, yeah, they came and they collapsed the Kabul as well, mm -hmm. and, I cried a lot that what's happening and uh, our 20 year struggles uh, now or uh, like we don't have any rights after today, we, we will not have any rights to pursue our education, to work, to like be side uh, by side with our brothers to, to, more for, to do more for our countries. But uh, yeah, there are like the situation, I, as I mentioned, uh, uh, is really horrible for, for uh, women in Afghanistan. They are in journalism, they are, they are like, they are working in media, they are working in other like uh, field, they are women rights activists, human rights defenders, politicians, all of them, they are banned for their work. But still, I was very impressed to see women nevertheless demonstrating, although they risk losing their lives for it. And you yourself, you organize underground schools for 
girls. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a bit about how that works? Yeah, uh, um, I'm so happy for mm -hmm. them because when I'm talking with my students and my teachers, it makes me more stronger. And uh, I'm trying to do more, more, more for them because they are in Afghanistan. They are uh, like, they are very, very, for me, they are like uh, hero. And for me, they are like more um, powerful people because in that situation, they are trying to pursue their education. Uh, yeah, um, I have underground schools uh, in South region, especially uh, some of other provinces of Afghanistan. Uh, they are uh, going to their schools every day uh, and they are talking with me and they want to do more because in these schools I am trying to have like some training for leadership, for like persuasion, uh, for their empowerment. And uh, yeah, we are doing this all things, these all activities. Uh, I'm uh, busy with uh, my schools, but uh, it's like private schools, like it's like secret schools mm -hmm. because uh, when Taliban know about them, of course, I, I know that they will stop them. Uh, and I'm trying to do like, uh, to not share their pictures, their like videos, all the things through social media, because I don't want to uh, put them in risk. Uh, and for me, it's important to, uh, to, to those girls, those girls with a lot of hope uh, that uh, they are now, in Afghanistan after collapse, after those all horrible things that happen in their life, they are still struggling. They are still want to learning something to want to uh, graduated from school. They are still want to, to be a, a journalist, uh, a, like lawyer, like a politicians. And they are still talking about these positions. Uh, that's like, it means that Afghan women are really strong. Uh, mm -hmm. They are they are coming on the street. They are demonstrating uh, about like the uh, those all restrictions that uh, uh, issues by the Taliban in front of them. Uh, they are like that. You you all uh, you all are in the media. You you are watching them that they are came on the streets and they are fighting with the Taliban face to face and they want their right. And outside of Afghanistan, there was a, there is a lot of human rights defenders, women rights activists that they are using every platform, every platform to raise their rights and uh, to tell to the world that and remind them there is a country that women, girls cannot go to, to school. Like this is in 21st century, uh, a country that girl cannot go to school. That's really tough. And uh, that's really horrible uh, for us, especially uh, to in the past 20 years that we struggled a lot. We had a lot of achievements with a lot of uh, traits that we faced every day, every day. Three times Taliban attack on me, like there was a lot of other things. They send me a lot of messages, straight letters, all the thing. But I I was like strong that, yeah, we will change it. We will change this, all the thing. Women will have all the their rights. One day they will like, they will, one of the, one of women will be president of our country one day. This was our hope, but suddenly, I don't know uh, why the world is silent. I, I'm thinking about this because I just want to, from world, from those countries that they are uh, doing coordination, meeting with them, please be honest with Afghan women, with those girls that they cannot like go to school, they had hope, they had like, they are bad, like they, they are prevented from everything. And I think one of the, this point is also very important because when you see the population of Afghanistan, 60% are underage. Yeah. So the future of Afghanistan is a huge, huge youth bulk in Afghanistan. Half of the men are literate and only a quarter of the women are literate. So these 
youth want to learn, they want to develop, and they want to regain their future. What, and this is why it's so important, the work you're doing, that you still manage to educate girls and to give them a chance and to give them the hope of a future. Yeah, because the, the Afghanistan future are uh, stuck. Uh, the Afghanistan uh, future are uh, like defruits, uh, the, with this band, defruits the society uh, in every uh, uh, places and every like uh, field. Uh, we should do more, more Afghan women are more like uh, stronger, then the Taliban are thinking, yeah, we are not the same women that they came in 1996 till 2001 and they did everything on us, they stopped us for everything on that time. We are changed. We want our uh, right and everywhere, in every way that we can, we can rise our voice, we do more activities, more activities to uh, to remind to all those people that they were in Doha with them, Doha agreement with them, mm -hmm. to tell them that we are 50% of population of Afghanistan, you cannot uh, forget us. Before I open the floor to your questions, I would like to ask Nashin as well on the relation between the, inter the international relation and the freedom within Turkey. Because what we have seen in those last years is that Erdogan gained more and more importance as a power player in geopolitical terms. So he's talking both to Russia and Ukraine. He's been meddling in the Middle East. He's been thinking about trade deals with Israel and now trying to propose that he's going to mediate again. So he emerged also because of the refugee crisis as a really big power player. Did that strengthen him to crush freedom within Turkey, especially on journalism or is there no relation? And also on the Turkish diaspora, does the diaspora have influence in Turkey? Um, very good question with a complicated answer. <laughs> so, I mean, um, Erdogan's foreign policy was all, also very volatile. So we had that period when the Arab Spring took off. They had their agenda by cooperating with the Muslim Brotherhood. They wanted to like own the regimes in the uh, in the Arab region, like um, you know Egypt, whatnot. They would like so their ideal was like to re um, resurrect the Ottoman Empire with the cooperation of the Muslim Brotherhood, and Turkey would be the big brother of all these ex Ottoman countries, and they would govern and whatnot. It obviously backfired because it was a stupid plan. And um, basically, you know, in Egypt, there was a coup d'etat, whatnot. And I mean, second of all, the people, ex most, I mean, the thing is, so Turks, literally what you're taught in school, in the Balkans and in the Maghreb area, we are taught that people loved living under the Ottoman Empire, literally. And they, they did not, I mean, but we cannot face that fact. So. Anyways, I mean, obviously nobody wanted them in the Maghrebian area. Then we had that period where Turkey was really isolated and they thought they'd be able to stand strong no matter, nobody likes us, but we can still stay, stand strong because we're Turkey. And of course it backfired that Turkey went bankrupt uh, because in this isolation period, also Erdogan had his own economic theory. theory. He has a theory. He claims he's an economist and the theory goes like, so if you decrease the interest rates, the inflation is going to decrease also. He has a theory and he wanted to implement it. It backfired, obviously. And so the isolation did not work either. So he realized, I mean, we are literally living in a political science 101 lesson as Turkey. It's like the economy does not work unless you don't have democracy. Ah, you cannot have democracy. You cannot have a you know, working economy unless you cooperate with other countries. Duh, you know, like we are basically like a little child we're learning. So uh, now he realizes he has to cooperate with other countries, basically have the dialogue working again with the EU, with Russia, whomever he can talk to, with Israel, with China, whatever he can get because Turkey is in dire need of money. And yes, I mean, I understand, I, I, I think at this, at this point, EU can lose, use their leverage uh, on Erdogan to push for uh, press freedom uh, carefully because I'm saying carefully because uh, Erdogan learned Europe's play also you see he's sending guys who are going to say stuff that Europeans will like and then do s something else 
in, in, in Turkey. So he has also learned to play. And also this refugee thing is going to backfire big time in Turkey. Uh, what he did with the European countries, I think this is such a shame for for Europe too. I'm sorry to say. But when he did develop, like, okay, we're going to get all the refugees from whatnot, Syria, Afghanistan, whatever. And you pay us money. Uh I understand, of course, people have the old right to escape from a war. My Afghan sisters have all the right to escape from Afghanistan, but it's not realistic for Turkey to take all the burden. I mean, it's it's not, I mean, it's, I, I'm trying to cover this issue and some towns and cities are pressure cooker. Mm -hmm. And if it erupts, it's not like, it's not gonna be like in Europe. We're gonna have pogroms, I'm telling you, I mean, because, because people are really pissed. When the economy is good, okay, we're all brothers. No, nobody cares. Yes, we love Syrians, what not, whatever, you know. But once uh, you hit the button and you cannot live on your uh, average wage, then you start looking at the foreigners and you're like, you know what, this Syrian is, I mean, that's what people say. This Syrian is going to a hospital, not paying a dime, and I cannot go to a supermarket and buy bread for my children. What is that? So that's what I'm saying. It's it's a pressure cooker. I understand for, for the European countries, it's really comfortable. Oh, who cares? This is this is Turkey. They're just gonna take whomever. And they'll just pay, pay them some money and they'll whatever, whatever they do. But this is turned into a sociological problem, and this is not uh, sustainable uh, politics for Turkey. So I think if we are going to share a burden of the local wars, of the Taliban government, uh, we have to share the burden. I mean, as the United States, you cannot just leave your nation building a project and like, okay, you know what? I mean, guys, Pakistan, Turkey, now you just handle this. We're just leaving. Goodbye. I mean, we spent enough money. I mean, come on. If this is a humanitarian issue, we all have to handle this. I understand European countries say, all oh, right, but when we have this, we have far right politics rising. Yeah, guess what? Same thing in Turkey. We have a Turkish, excuse my language, Nazist party gaining traction in Turkish politics. And it's going to turn into a disaster, I'm telling you. So, yeah. Thank you. So we have a couple of minutes left. And I would like to open the floor to you to ask questions to our panelists. If you have any, just please wave because it's really hard to see you. If not, I'm going to ask questions <laughs> that interest me. <laughs> so in, in the meantime, while you're thinking about how to phrase your question, I would like to ask about the response of Western governments. As you mentioned, two years, two years already from Afghanistan, women, women's freedom disappeared completely. And, and we have reactions from Western governments. Our German government said, yes, the situation is dire. We're going to finance some shelters. And that's about it. What would be useful? What would you expect from Western governments in this situation to, have Af to help Afghan women? Uh, I think they should first stop these statements. Two years, just statements, statements, statements. This, these statements cannot help with Afghan women. We have all, we have Afghan women also have like the same statements, uh, like through social media. Uh, the world also have these statements, like the, what want Afghan women through social media. They are like putting this word in their statements and they are like publishing this. I, I think these statements, uh, cannot help with Afghan women. They should like uh, use the international law, uh, re especially related to human rights uh, issue, uh, related to gender apartheid in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, they should like uh, use those uh, um, laws and they should like leave these statements and do more pressure on the Taliban to uh, stop they're like banned uh, on women of Afghanistan. And also uh, one of uh, other things uh, that please increase uh, humanitarian uh, aids for Afghanistan because uh, they need it. And, and uh, But not like this, they should have accountability on this. 
because uh, there's a, a lot of like um, I'm I'm receiving a lot of messages and calls from Afghanistan that they are uh, telling to me uh, we are uh, we have not received any aid till now. There's a lot of areas that the uh, these aids uh, not like uh, uh, they they didn't receive this aid because um, there's like a of course, corruption on this and uh, Taliban are putting uh, those uh, people uh, name in the list that uh, it's belonged to them, their fam family, all their relatives. And uh, they should have accountability on this because, uh, yeah, they are helping. Uh, uh, they are uh, sending humanitarian aids to Afghanistan, but it's not uh, um, there's no accountability organization that they have accountability on this uh, aid. Um, and would you say, because I looked it up as a counterterrorism expert, there have been no sanctions imposed on the Taliban since 2011. So since 2011, we have quite few sanctions on individuals of the Taliban, but there has no, not been any movement like with Iran, which is also not a lot of sanctions, but at least would you say that would help or would it not yeah, of course, they should like uh, use some sanction on them uh, instead of uh, talking with them inside of Afghanistan. Like they have a lot of a lot of time. Uh, we saw that uh, there is a lot of AU members, UN members that they have coordination meeting with with the Taliban inside of Afghanistan. They are talking with them. Uh, it's like a kind of normalizing the Taliban. Mm -hmm. uh, these meetings, these statements cannot help with with women of Afghanistan, especially if they are honest with Afghan women. They should like uh, take some action on the Taliban, like use some sanction, uh, some other like things that uh, we have in international law that mm -hmm. they can use it. We have a question here. From the lady in front. Okay, if everyone can hear me, I can also. I can also repeat it for the live stream. Okay. Yeah. Um, we have courageous, strong, and very impressive women here. But I'm asking myself a lot of times what is the role of men um, in stepping up and in helping the situation of women, um, either in Afghanistan or also for uh, women in, in Turkey or anywhere in the world? What is your view on this? So the question is, we see a lot of courageous women, both in Turkey and in, in Afghanistan, and of course in Iran. But what is the role of women in Turkey and in Afghanistan? Nefshin, do you want to go first? Men helping women? Uh, I mean, we have an NGO called We uh, Stand Beside You, Yanındayız Derni, uh, supporting feminist women. But I mean, in that sense, I think, as I said, feminist <laughs> the movement is very robust in Turkey. Uh, so the thing is, I mean, the problem is, it's really, I mean, the party in power, AK Party, is like a conservative traditionalist party with a pinch of Islamism, now with a pinch of nationalism and whatnot. So traditions are the most important to them. And I think it's like, like when you say tradition, it's the, for men, it's their comfort zone. Because traditions, let's face it, no matter, they're not really woman friendly, right? <laughs> so, you know, when you go, oh, our traditions, whatnot, it's, it's, it's a cage for women. So, but then, um, as far as I say, even, even, even in the, in the left, it's really harder for men to leave their comfort zone and face, you know, it's going to be a new world with a changed societal rules. Are you ready for that? I am sometimes not sure if, if the majority is, 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 um, ready for that. Yeah. Uh, I'm asking from all of you, how many, uh, women president, uh, we have in the world? It is not only the issue in Afghanistan and Turkey. It is, it is the issue in all the all of wo world, all of the country of worlds, because we don't have like many uh, like women in in a high positions in the world. This is a big issue. We should together work on this, and that's not issue. On Afghan in Afghanistan and Turkey and other like countries of Ash uh, Asian countries, it's an issue in America in in AU countries. We don't have any like 
in, in a high position, every high position, there's man, but GPT, yeah, it will be women. Why? Why women cannot like be in that positions? I have this question from all of you that we should come together and work on this because uh, it's uh, a big issue, I think. I think that is a good end note that it's our responsibility, both for women and for men, to uphold freedom, freedom of press, freedom to report on the violations of human rights and women's rights, of course. And I would like to thank our panelists, the Friedrich Naumann Stiftung für die Freiheit, for organizing the Raif Badavi talk, and a big thank to Nefshin Mengu and Vashma Toki for joining us. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>